Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar on the Scottish election. We'll wait for just a few more people to join us and then make a start in a minute or so. Hi everyone, thanks for joining today. We'll just give people another minute to join and then make a start. Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar on the Scottish election with just over two weeks to go. I'm Emily Gray, I'm Managing Director of Ipsos Mori Scotland and I'm joined today by Rachel Ormston who is my colleague and Research Director at Ipsos Mori Scotland. Over the next hour or so we're going to be talking about what is arguably the most important Scottish election since devolution started in 1999. So Rachel will be taking us through where we are just now, so the current state of play and what the polls are telling us. And then I'll talk a bit about what could happen post-election in this critical election for the future of Scotland, but also for the, for the future of the UK. We will have presentations for around 40 to 45 minutes, and then we'll take and then we'll take as many as possible of your of your questions in the time that's remaining. We're here till here till one o'clock today. And do feel free to submit your questions through the chat function. Then Rachel and I will be able to see those and we'll be able to, to take your questions at the end. So thank you very much for joining us today. And Rachel, over to you on the current state of play. Thanks, Emily, and, and thank you all for coming. I'm still not used to, to not being able to see everyone in the room, but um, delighted to be joining you all virtually. Um, so as Emily said, I'm going to talk you through what the polls are telling us about the, the current state of play, um, starting off with voting intention, which I guess is the, the key thing that people are interested in, but also um, looking at views of the party leaders and views of, views of the different political parties in Scotland. Um, based, we'll base it primarily on, on our own Ipsos Mori Scotland polling conducted since um, autumn of last year. Um, and then finally, and particularly importantly, given, especially as, as, as you'll see, given the, the relative stability of, of some of the findings, um, we want to look at whether there is still scope for things to change before May the 6th. Could, 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 things, could the campaign still make a difference? So this first chart is showing headline voting intention for the constituency vote in the Scottish Parliament elections. And as most of you probably know, um, voters in Scottish Parliament elections get two votes, um, one for an individual MSP for their constituency, and then um, another vote for a, a party on the, the regional list. Um, so this is showing constituency vote. It's, it's based on the, the four polls that we've conducted since autumn of last year. Um, and it is based on likely voters, which, which different polling companies define in, in different ways. But for us, likely voters are people who say there are at least nine out of 10 likely to vote in, in a Scottish Parliament election. And what you can see from this really, um, the overall picture is that there hasn't been a huge amount of change in people's voting intentions over the last six months or so. Um, certainly, uh, the, the SNP vote is down a little bit. It was at 58%, very high in, in, in uh, October 2020, so maybe a little bit of the shine coming off the SNP. Um, 
the Labour vote in contrast has gone up a little, 13% in October, up to 18% in, in our most recent poll, just conducted at the start of this month. So their, their situation's a little less dire. Um, but the basic picture is, is basically pretty much unchanged since autumn 2020. There is a bit more movement um, in terms of people's voting intentions for the regional list vote. As you can see, the, the SNP share of the vote went down quite a bit um, between our February, February of this year and, and April of this year. Um, that is not, as you might have expected, primarily as a result of people switching to, to the Alaba party. Um, we estimated them on only around 3% of, of the, the list vote. But in fact, the Greens have gone up uh, by four percentage points and Labour are also um, up four percentage points on February. So, so um, the, share of the, the increase in the share of the Green vote, perhaps suggesting that, that one of the main impacts of, of Alaba has been to encourage pro-independence voters to consider how to use their regional list vote tactically, but, but perhaps um, benefit the Greens rather than Alaba themselves. But again, looking across the piece, overall the picture is really much the same. Um, the order of the parties is pretty much the same. Not a huge amount has changed in the last six months. The SNP obviously may be a, a bit concerned about the drop in their share of the list vote, but in truth their um, ability to pick up MSPs on the regional list is, is quite constrained by, um, by how well they appear, like, appear to be going to do on the constituency vote. Um, we don't go in for seat projections based on our polling. As you know, it's a poll of a, around each poll is a poll of around a thousand people. There are a lot of regional um, issues um, to to model that that make it difficult to to accurately project seats from from polls. But if you do go in for that kind of thing, if you plug these figures into the election polling website. Um, it, our most recent April figures would they would estimate would deliver around 69 constituency seats for the SNP. So actually, even just on on the constituency vote alone might be enough to deliver an outright majority for the SNP. And certainly, it looks very likely at this point that there will be a majority of MSPs in favour of independence, whether that's um, the SNP alone or the SNP in combination with the Green Party and potential Alba Party MSPs. And just to reinforce how little change the polls are showing, and also that it's not just, just our polls that show this, um, I've got a chart here which shows um, in the um, red columns the actual 2016 Scottish Parliament election results in terms of vote, constituency vote share. And then the, the green columns show the um, average vote share according to uh, the five polls that have been conducted um, in early April this year um, up to Friday of last week. I don't think there have been any polls since then, but if I've missed one, apologies. Um, uh, but what you can see from this is, is basically overall the, the mean of estimate of the current polls is very close to the actual um, outcome of the 2016 um, elections. And that's similar on the list vote. The Greens look possibly slightly up, um, Labour, the Tories and the SNP possibly slightly down on the, uh, the 2016 outcome. But overall, the picture is, is very similar to, to what the actual, actual results were in 2016. So what we can see from this is that at the top level, really there's a remarkable stability in voting intention, both over the last six months, but also even compared to, to the 2016 Scottish Parliament election. Um, but when we start to look at some of the wider political attitudes that we ask about in our polls, um, so looking at views of the leaders and views of uh, trust in the parties to deliver on different areas, the picture is, is perhaps not quite as static as these, these headline figures might suggest. So moving on to look at the leaders first, the first thing to take from this chart, which is showing um, in the, the, the green bits of the bars are the proportion of people who are satisfied with the, the performance that each of the, of the, each of the leaders, um, the red bit is the proportion dissatisfied and the gray bit in the middle is, is the people who, who don't know, who don't have an opinion either way. And the first thing obviously to note from this is that Nicola Sturgeon's ratings are really astonishingly high. Um, UK Prime Minister's just never have this kind of rating after seven years um, in government. Um, Blair had these kind of ratings in 1997, but even by the end of 2002, he was regularly um, in, in getting net negative ratings. Um, Boris Johnson's most recent rating in our UK political monitor in March was minus seven. And actually that's not bad by historic standards. So the fact that Nicola Sturgeon after seven years still has a net positive rating of plus 29 is, is, is really quite, quite remarkable. 
And the second thing I think to take from this chart, though, is that Anasawa has certainly created a very favourable initial impression. 46% um, satisfied with him, 20% dissatisfied. Um, and he is certainly currently more people in Scotland satisfied with his performance as leader of Scottish Labour than are satisfied with, with Douglas Ross as leader of the Scottish Conservatives. Um, however, when we move on to look at, um, um, I said that there, there was some more change in, in wider political attitudes. And when we, when we look at how leaders were rated in 2016 compared with how the party leaders are rated now, we do see a bit more change, um, at least for Labour and the Conservatives. Um, not so much for Nicola Sturgeon, actually. Her ratings are almost as high now as they were just before the 2016 Scottish Parliament elections. Um, just to note, um, obviously, it, they're not strictly comparable because this is um, the, the left hand side of this chart is showing ratings of Alex Salmond when he was first minister and leader of the SNP ahead of the 2011 elections. But you can see that his rating at that point was net positive of 33. His rating now as leader of Alaba is uh, minus 55. And uh, it's just that's particularly striking because I'm not aware of any other leader in the UK whose ratings have, have changed to, to that degree. Looking at Sawa though, you can see his ratings are not only better than Douglas Ross's at the moment, but they're also considerably better than his predecessors. So he has a net positive rating of plus 26. Richard Leonard back in October had a net negative of minus 26. Um, but prior to the previous um, Scottish Parliament elections, Kezia Dugdale was on minus 11. Um, Ian Gray a bit better, but still only on plus one. So, so he certainly appears to have created um, a pretty um, favourable initial impression on voters in Scotland. In contrast, Douglas Ross is, is much less popular than the women who led the Conservatives into the 2011 and 2016 elections. He, his net, net score is minus 23 compared with plus 15 for Ruth Davidson in 2016 and plus 10 for, for Annabelle Goldie back in 2011. So looking at how far people trust the main parties to deliver um, across different areas of policy, again, here we see a kind of mixed picture in terms of the extent to which public views of the parties are shifting at all. So on the one hand, um, this is showing trust in the SNP and, and the SNP still dominate really on this on this question. They're very highly trusted um, across a, a large number of policy areas. And as we see on the net, we'll see on the next charts, they are, they are more trusted than either Labour or the Conservatives. On the other hand, their ratings have slipped a little. So this chart is showing um, how, how much people said they trusted the SNP on these issues in our most recent poll, um, start of April. But you can see in the column on the right hand side it shows the, the, the change in the proportion who said they trusted the SNP um, compared with the last time we asked this in November 2020. And you can see that there's a five point percentage point drop in the proportion who trusts the SNP to stand up for Scotland's interests, four percentage point drop in, in trust to, to tackle inequality in Scotland. So again, perhaps a little bit of the shine coming off the SNP, although still a very, very strong ratings. Um, in contrast, Labour's ratings have, have increased quite substantially since Sawa took over as party leader. So you can see um, again in the right hand column that there's been a 12 percentage point increase in the proportion of people in Scotland who trust Scottish Labour to tackle inequality, um, a 12 point increase in the proportion who trust them to respond to the COVID crisis in Scotland and, and so on. So really um, quite, quite a significant um, uh, positive improvement for the Labour Party there. Ratings of the, the Conservatives, in contrast, have both been consistently lower, so fewer people saying they, they trust the Conservative Party to deal effectively with these areas, consistently lower than either Labour or the SNP, but also more consistent over time. So the only significant change really is that there has been a slight increase in the proportion who say they would trust the Scottish Conservatives to respond to the coronavirus crisis in Scotland. And that uh, may possibly reflect um, relatively positive responses to, um, to the Conservative UK government's vaccine rollouts, which certainly seems to have Im improved their rating slightly in, in Scotland. So given the picture that we've seen so far, we've seen relatively stable headline voting intention, but at the same time, some quite interesting shifts in uh, ratings of the leaders and degree of trust in the parties to deliver across policy areas, and particularly that, that particularly being the case for Scottish Labour. 
So how much scope actually is there then for, for things to change significantly before the 6th of May? Well, I suppose the first thing to, to note is that voters' views are not necessarily fixed. Um, and we asked um, those voters who, who expressed a voting intention, who mentioned a party that they, they were inclined to vote for at least, um, had they definitely decided to vote for, for that party or might they still change their mind? And as you can see from this, around a quarter of voters said, no, they might still change their mind. So, so there is some scope for shift there. Um, what's particularly interesting about this chart, I think, is, is how soft it indicates the Labour vote uh, might be. So 37% um, of Labour voters say they may still change their mind on their constituency vote. On the list vote, overall, slightly more voters say they, they might change their mind about how they use their party list vote. 32% um, uh, say they might change their mind before election day. Um, here, not so much Labour that stands out as, as the Conservatives as being um, less likely to say they might change their mind. So, so Conservative voters are a bit more, more fixed in, the, in their views about how they will vote. We also looked at what issues might influence how people vote. So we asked, we asked people, what if any issues you think will be very important to you in helping you decide which party to vote for? And that was um, an open question. So we didn't prompt them at all. We, our interviewers just coded the answers that, that, that it gave us spontaneously. And I think people's answers give us some important clues as to what, what scope there actually is for, for views to shift and what might influence that. And what you can see is that Scottish independence and devolution is really the, the top issue mentioned spontaneously by almost half of the voters that we spoke to. And it's also significant that, that if anything, it's becoming more important to people the closer we get to the election. So, so that 49% is up five percentage points on our, our February, 20, uh, February 2021 poll. And this dominance of independence among the issues that, that are influencing, people say are influencing their votes, um, is it's that that may ultimately constrain the possibility as of, seeing, of us seeing any kind of dramatic change in people's voting attention, intentions ahead of May the 6th. And what this chart is showing is basically how strongly aligned people's voting intentions and their attitudes to independence now are. So you can see that on the constituency vote, among people who are inclined to vote yes in any potential future referendum on independence, nine out of 10 say they will vote for the SNP on their constituency vote. And on the list vote, um, SNP share of the yes vote not quite as high, but overall you've got 66% saying they'll vote for the SNP, 18% saying they'll vote for the Scottish Greens who are also pro-independence, 5% saying they'll vote for Alaba. So what this means is essentially that the three unionist parties are largely fishing in the same pond for, for voters, while the SNP at least on the constituency vote, is basically the sole option for, for in most constituencies for pro-independence voters. The, the Greens are only standing in around 12 out of the, the 73 constituencies. So in summary, where are we at at the moment and what's the scope for change? Um, the SNP are clearly well ahead in terms of voting intention on both the constituency and the regional list. They also have a very popular leader. So really the, the, the question there is, is, will they do enough to get an outright majority or will they, they have to rely on the, the Greens or, or possibly the odd um, Alaba MSP for, for support? But I think perhaps the most interesting question is, is who will come in second and will Scottish Labour be able to do enough in the remaining time to, to take second place from the Conservatives? We've seen that Sawa seems to be very popular, but a challenge for them, I think, is that at least part of his popularity is among voters who are pro-independence, who, who, who are generally quite inclined to, to view Sawa favourably as well. Um, and because at the moment voters who are pro-independence seem disinclined to, to vote for Labour, um, the fact that he's popular among that group may not be all that much help to him right now. Ross, we've seen Douglas Ross is, is much less popular um, overall, um, but uh, part of that is because he is very unpopular among people who do support independence, but who, th that's a group that are not very likely to vote for the Conservatives at the moment anyway. So really the question is whether Anasawa's personal popularity and his, his positioning of himself as kind of above the fray of, of mudslinging around independence is going to be enough to tempt people away from either the Scottish Conservatives or to, to tempt perhaps some soft uh, pro-independence support away from the SNP before May the 6th. 
and I'm going to hand back to Emily now who is going to talk through some of the wider implications of the uh, the results of the Scottish Parliament elections. Hi everyone, so I'm going to take you through what might happen next post-election, both in the next parliamentary term and, and beyond, because I think we may well look back on this election in 2021 as a critical point in the future, both of Scotland, um, but also, also of the wider UK. And a really crucial question there is whether the SNP are able to win a majority of seats, so at least 65 seats out of the 129 seats available to MSPs in the, in the Scottish Parliament. That's something that they were able to do for the first time at the 2011 election when they, were, when, when they won 69 seats. Um, at 20, since 2016, they have been a minority government. Um, so they have relied on the support of the Scottish Greens in order to be able to get um, to in, in, terms, in terms of support for pro independent for pro independence um, legislation and so on. Um, but something that gets sometimes gets lost in the debate is just that it's actually really difficult for any one party to win an overall majority of seats under Scotland's electoral system, the additional member system. Um, but despite that, it's going to be really important to the SNP leadership to win a majority of seats on the 6th of May. And the party leadership, I think, will be on tenter hooks throughout this, this, this election, election campaign. So let's have a look at what, why that matters and what might happen next. Next slide, please, Chris Whitty style. So I think there are two possible scenarios in the short term. The first of these is that the SNP does win that majority of seats, so get 65 or more. Uh, and the second scenario is that the SNP doesn't win a majority and just fall, falls short, short of the 65 that it needs. Um, under that second scenario, it's still likely that with the Greens and possibly also MSPs from the Alaba party, depending on how, on, on how, on how they do, there, there would still be a pro-independence majority of MSPs in the, in the Scottish Parliament. So those are the two different scenarios, which I'll talk through in a bit more, a bit more detail now. Um, but whichever of these comes to pass, I think it's absolutely clear that the issue of independence and the issue of a second referendum um, are, are, really, are, are not going away. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the first scenario. So if the, if the SNP do win a majority, and the pitch from the SNP is that the Scot it should be up to the Scottish people to decide their own future in a second referendum. So this, the excerpt that you can see on the slide is from, is from the SNP manifesto. And on the timing of a referendum, the SNP position is that, you know, if the COVID crisis has passed, then that referendum should be held in the first half of this parliamentary term. So before late 2023. And if and and the the thinking behind that is that you know, if a majority of the Scots were to vote vote yes to independence, then Scotland would then have more powers to be able to drive the recovery from the COVID crisis and to build back better from it. Of course, it looks unlikely that the UK government under Boris Johnson would consent to this second referendum. But if the SNP does win a majority of seats at Holyrood, that makes it much more difficult to maintain that, that position. And that's why it's just so that's why it's so important to the SNP. Next slide, please. But if there was a second referendum, at the moment it is far from clear what the outcome would be. So in our latest polling, we have yes very narrowly ahead. So 52% of people in Scotland say that they would vote yes if a referendum were held tomorrow. 48% told us that they would vote no. Um, as you can see, strikingly similar to the, to the Brexit referendum figure. And as you, can, as you can see, support for yes started rising in 2018. And it reached its high, it's reached record levels towards the end of 2020. So when we polled on this at Ipsos Mori in, in October 2020, we found support for yes at 58%, which was the highest, highest it has ever been. And we can perhaps talk more in the Q&A about the reasons for that. So Brexit was a factor behind the, the rise in support for yes from 2018 onwards, but then more recently factors such as the pandemic and the leadership 
the, and, uh, and, and the leadership shown during the pandemic have, have made a difference. But as you can see, support for YES has started to has slipped back a bit in recent months. And where we are now is that voter opinion is, is divided. The SNP used to say a few years ago that they would want to see um, they want, would want to see the yes support consistently at 60% or so um, ahead of a second referendum. It's certainly not, not near those levels at the moment. Next slide, please. So, but in Scotland, as across all nations of the UK, more people support a second referendum if the SNP does win a majority in May than, than, than oppose one. So when we look at the, this, these results are from Ipsos Mori's UK Knowledge Panel. We surveyed 8,500 people online across the UK. And what we, what we found was that over, just over half of UK adults, 51%, feel that the UK government should allow the Scottish government, this, 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 this Scotland to hold another independence referendum within the five, next five years if the SNP win a majority. Okay. And, but you can, and you can also see the differences here by nation, which I think underscores just how different this, how different the, the question of independence looks depending on where you are in the UK. So in Scotland, 56% say that the UK government should allow, this, allow Scotland to hold another independence referendum in the next five years. In Northern Ireland, that jumps to two, two thirds. So where, whereas in, in England and Wales, although a majority are still, still in favor, um, it's just it's the proportion is just so just over half. Okay, and in terms of what would need to happen for a second a second independence vote, the UK government would need to agree to transfer powers to the Scottish the Scottish Parliament to uh, to allow this, and that can either be done by a permanent transfer of powers, or as as was done previously for the 2014 referendum, through a temper a more temporary transfer under a called a, a Section 30 order. Next slide, please. And this slide here shows how views on a second independence referendum break down by political party support. Because, you know, as I said, the, an SNP majority would present a huge challenge for Boris, for Boris Johnson. But actually, this is also a very difficult issue for Labour. So, as and when you and you can see that views um, views among Labour voters in Scotland are different from how they look among Labour voters across the wider UK. So in Scotland, Labour people who voted Labour back, in, back at the 2019 general election are split. S slightly more on balance uh, feel that the UK government shouldn't allow a second independence referendum in the, in the next five years than feel it should. Um, but across the UK, actually two thirds of Labour, Labour Party voters feel that actually the UK government should allow a, a second referendum in the next five years. So I think this this presents this issue does present big challenges for, for Scottish Labour, as, as Rachel's already alluded to, because Anasawa's position has been to, um, to, to to talk about other other issues, doesn't want to talk about independence, wants to focus on the, the recovery from the pandemic, education, the NHS and uh, and and so on. Uh, but it's it's difficult to it's I think this this is kind of Labour's Labour's Achilles heel in Scotland really um, because it is still an issue that voters care about and that Labour supporters are divided on. Next slide, please. So it's possible that the UK government may refuse to transfer the powers to the Scottish Parliament to hold a second referendum. And there are a few different courses of action that are open to, that will be open to the Scottish government if that if that happens. One would just be to accept that a referendum can't be held in the next five years unless the UK government changes its mind. Another would a course of action could be legal action, so taking the UK government to court to try and establish a legal basis for holding a referendum. Um, there's also the option of holding the, the referendum anyway without the UK government's consent. Um, but that kind of wildcat Catalonia, potentially Catalonia style referendum is one that certainly the SNP would you know, have indicated that they would, that they would not support. They, their, their position and their manifesto is that any second referendum needs to be legitimate and it needs to be internationally recognized. 
but we put these options to the Scottish public asking okay so if in the event that the SNP does win a majority but the UK government refuses to allow a second referendum what should the Scottish government do and just over two in five 42 percent told us that well actually we should just accept that another referendum can't be can't be held over the next five years a third for a third favoured legal action and just under one in five said that the, the Scotland should hold the referendum, referendum anyway. But what, what this becomes particularly interesting when you break it down by yes and no support. So what we see here is that among people who are among unionists are no supporters, as you would expect, over, the overwhelming feeling is that if if this were to happen, then the Scottish then then Scotland should accept that a referendum can't be held in the next five years. But for yes supporters, the pattern looks very different. So over half of yes supporters are in favour of the Scottish government taking legal action against the UK government in the event that it refuses a second referendum. And a third would support um, the, the referendum being held anyway without the UK government's consent, which I think under, underscores the, the strength of feeling on the, on the independence issue. Next slide, please. Okay. Well, again, this is the, this this slide shows our UK public polling, and although although a majority feel that Scotland should have a second referendum if the SNP wins wins a majority, nonetheless, half of us would prefer Scotland to vote against it. So, fifty percent of, of of adults across the UK say that they would prefer Scotland to vote against the second referendum. Um, under a third of us, so 28% say that we don't mind either way, and then 17% say that they would vote, prefer Scotland to vote, vote for independence. But again, we have broken this out by, by, by the four nations of the UK here, and you can see that again, the perspective, your, you, you know, your, your view is likely to differ depending on where, on, on where you live in the UK. So in Scotland, um, as you would expect, given that, pe that people are split on independence over on on independence overall, um, that will, they, the people people tell us here that they are that they're split on um, whether Scotland should vote for or against leaving the UK. In the, the pattern in Northern Ireland is also very interesting. So you have a 30% who told us that they would prefer Scotland to vote for in, independence, um, while while a further third. 35% said that they would vote, vote, prefer Scotland to vote against. Next slide, please. Okay, so that's the first scenario for if the SNP does win a majority and there would then be huge pressure on the UK government for a second referendum. But what happens if the SNP falls short of that majority? Well, this man here is co Patrick Harvey, co-leader of the Scottish Greens, riding in on his bike. So the most likely scenario here is that the SNP would form a minority government, as they as uh, as, uh, as as they do at present, and but then that they would rely on the support of other pro-independence MSP or, or other pro-independence parties in the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Greens, but also potentially the Alaba Party if they pick up one or two one or two seats in on the sixth of May, and so they would rely on other other pro-independence parties for their support for, for, get it, for, for, getting, for, for getting constitutional issues through. And there is also the possibility of talks between the SNP and the Greens um, about, about working together in partnership or in coalition, but in my view the more likely outcome is that the SNP form, forms a, majority, a minority government if they fail to win, win a majority. Um, but I think the important thing to remember is that whichever of these two scenarios comes to pass, the issue of independence and the issue of a second referendum are not going are not going away. So the likely thing is that even if the SNP doesn't win a majority, there is still likely to be a majority of pro-independence MSPs overall um, at Holyrood. So the, and those pro-independence parties then would still be likely to try to put pressure on the UK government to transfer the powers to hold a second referendum. Okay. And but the but so how do people view the longer term prospects for Scotland for Scotland and the Union? So we asked 
again, our 8,500 people across the, across the UK about whether they think the UK will or will not exist in its current form in one, five, 10, 20 years time. I think the findings show a sense of inevitability. So over half of adults across the UK say that the UK probably won't exist as it is now in a decade. And again, the, the, the picture looks very different between the different nations. So three in five people in Scotland say that, and it's a similar proportion in Northern Ireland. And if, if Scotland were to become independent, then how would we feel about it? Uh, next slide, please. So two in five of us say, say that we would feel sad if, left, if Scotland left the UK, um, but actually all, almost as many say that it would, 38% say that it would make, it would make no difference. And the findings are quite sim similar across England and Wales, but again, where you see a different differences in opinion is in Northern Ireland. So a quarter of people in Northern Ireland say that say they would feel mostly happy if we're, if Scotland were left the UK, which I think reflects the unique constitutional system in uh, unique constitutional situation in in Northern Ireland. Next slide, please. And what would the impact be if Scotland did become independent? So most people in the UK believe that Scotland itself would be weaker in, if, if independent. So three in five of us say that, say that Scotland would be weaker if it, were, if it were to go its own way. But in Scotland, again, the picture looks a bit different. Scots are split on this. So 45% of people in Scotland believe that Scotland would be stronger if it was independent. 48% feel that it, it, will be, it will be weaker. So again, split, split on that. And when it comes to the wider UK, here a majority in all four nations of the UK believe that the impact would, not be, would, would be negative overall for the UK if Scotland were to become independent. So 59% of us say that the UK would be weaker if, if Scotland were to, were to become independent. So, so, so in terms of people's views on the on the longer term, the longer term prospects for the UK. Next slide, please. Okay. So to wrap up then, so whichever of the two scenarios that I've outlined comes to pass, so whether the SNP wins a majority or not on the 6th of May, a push for a second independence referendum following the election looks inevitable. But as we've seen, the outcome of any future referendum looks really far from certain. So public opinion is divided. And while, ne while yes is narrowly ahead at the moment, the polls are still a long way off that consistent 60% level of support that the SNP would, I would, would ideally like. And there's still you know, so much that's unclear about, how an in about what, what an ind independent Scotland might look like. So, uh, and three things that I would pick out, First, EU membership. So it is likely that independent Scotland would be able to apply to rejoin the EU, but how long that would take and the terms on which it would be able to join, uh, you know, are, are very unclear at this point. And also raise the prospect then of a hard border between England and Scotland. So the so border issues, I think, will be a key will be key territory to do to that that would come up in any future referendum debate and also the currency issues that were so prominent in the debate ahead of the 2014 um, indep independence referendum. Um, so, so still a huge amount that's, that's unclear, but what is clear is that the independence issue is, is not going away. So you've, you've heard from Rachel and, and I about where things, how things stand now and where they might go next. But before getting onto the questions, we'd like to share with you just a two minute video on just allowing you to hear about this from undecided voters in Scotland themselves. So in partnership with Holyrood magazine, Ipswich Moray Scotland um, has been hearing from a small group of voters who haven't made, hadn't made up their minds yet about how they were going to vote on the 6th of May. They've been keeping an app diary for us throughout the election campaigns. And this two minute clip just shares their stories. So I hope you enjoy the video and then we'll have time for questions afterwards. Uh, I believe it's quite a critical election because the Scottish government are gonna to have to deal with the aftermath of Brexit, potentially another independence vote. 
uh, as well as coming out of the global pandemic. I think everyone's going to be point scoring on this independence. And you know, it's a bit like Brexit. I don't know how other people feel, but I, I'm tired of it. I really am tired of it. You know, let's, you know, there's more things important at the moment. We're looking to make a better society. I think there's a lot of people on the ground that that's what, that's what they want from an independent Scotland. And I think that independence will bring us a step closer to that, to being a, a fairer society, a more just society. I would like to hear more about how we get Scotland back onto a stronger economic foundation and what are the big plans for the future? The education system for the next generation, making sure that they're equipped to come into a world that's just completely changed upside down. Uh, mental health is another big thing that I'm going to be looking for. You can't see it, but it's there and it's affecting quite a lot of lives. Hi everyone. So welcome back. Hope you enjoyed hearing from our from our undecided voters about how they're how they're experiencing the the election so far. So thank you very much for the questions that you've been sending through on the chat. And the first question we have comes from Graham Deer, who's chairman of British Poultry. Graham asks, why did you include independence and devolution together when they're fundamentally different? So do people vote S SNP because they want independence or do they vote SNP because they believe they will be best for managing devolution issues for Scotland while remaining part of the UK? So Rachel, what's, what's your view on that? Okay, thank you. Um, that's, that's a very good question. So on the um, independence and devolution, so I am presuming uh, that, that Graham's referring to, to the chart that was showing the, the most important issues affecting how people will vote. So the first thing to say about that is that we uh, we don't present um, our, our, the people that we're interviewing with, with any options there. We just code what they say. And so the Scottish independence slash devolution category is really a kind of catch-all category for, for responses that say either I'm voting SNP because I want independence or I'm voting uh, Conservative, for example, because because I'm very opposed to independence, as well as any other issues that are kind of around the Constitution. So basically constitutional concerns and issues come un come under that. Um, in terms of whether people are voting SNP because they want independence or because they they want them to deliver kind of strong government within within a devolved Scotland, I think the answer to that really um, is is seen in in the, the chart that sort of followed that, which showed that the kind of the extent of the the correlation between supporting it or opposing independence and voting for the SNP. And the thing that's worth noting about that is that. Um, now, nine out of ten yes supporters vote SNP and relatively few no supporters would vote SNP. That was not the case even back in 2016. It certainly wasn't the case in 2011 when the SNP's pitch to, to, to the Scottish people ahead of the 2011 election was very much, you know, we will have a referendum on independence later. This election is about competence to govern Scotland. And you did see much more um, uh, kind of fluidity in terms of people's attitudes to independence and how they then voted back in 2011 and again even in, in, in 2016. Whereas since then, the, the, the correlation between your your views on independence and how you vote has become so close that I think it, it really is about that rather than about trust in you know wanting wanting the SNP to deliver good government within a devolved government although obviously that will be a, a factor but but the, the 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 strength of the relationship between those two things is just much closer than it has been in the past. So thanks, Rachel. Yeah. So Emily, I was I was going to pass over to you um, for with another question, which is, um, 
really about um, why support for independence has changed since 2014. So obviously, you know, Scotland um, voted to remain in the union in, in 2014, but since then it has gone up and then, you know, possibly gone up to the high point of 58% that you referred to back in, in October and then slipped a little bit, but, but it has certainly risen since 2014. And what do you think are the, the factors behind that? Well, there are a number of factors behind that rise in support, in support for yes. And I guess the first one to mention is, is Brexit. So, of course, the majority of Scots voted to remain at the 2016 rep referendum on, on, on EU membership. And we didn't, what's interesting is that, that that didn't change right away, but it started to change from kind of 2018 onwards. And what, what was changing is that Remain supporters in Scotland um, began to think actually we would rather be in an independent Scotland in, which we could then rejoin the EU than, with it, than, than in, in a Scotland within the UK but out, out, of, the, out of the EU. And so the, so the shift that you saw from 2018 onwards was largely from, from Remain supporters. Then, but then we saw a further uplift in, twen in 2020. So from you know from summer 2020 onwards, yes was consistently a ahead in the polls. And I think the re the reason for that for that shift was was different. That was much more to do with the pandemic, which I guess made decisions that were taken by the devolved government in Scotland and indeed in the other nations of the UK to to the public sphere much more visible. So it was devolution in action and devolution much more visible than it than it had been pre previously. And also things like Nicola Sturgeon's leadership and cautious approach over the course of the pandemic, which I think struck a chord with with people with the, with the public mood in Scotland because it reflected how people how people themselves were feeling in terms of anxiety and wanting to move relatively relatively cautiously in terms of op opening up again. Um, so, but in recent months, we've seen support support for yes slip back again. And actually, this where, who support seems to have slipped among are the same are the same groups who who had driven the rise in support for yes last year. So women, for example, middle aged voters, and so on. Um, so I think it just underlines the importance of the you know of of those people whose support for independence or or against is quite soft. And so there is in terms of both for both both um, independent supporters and for unionists. Um, that that group in the middle will be it will be a crucial group to convince in the in the event of a second referendum. And I, and I think I'm right in saying as well that our last poll we asked people um, who said they would vote either yes or no a, a similar question to the one that I showed in relation to Scottish Parliament voting intention, which was you know have you definitely decided that if there is a future referendum you will vote yes or you'll vote no or is there a chance you might change your mind? And I think. Um, uh, that showed around one in ten voters said they could still change their minds, so lower than for Scottish okay. Parliament elections, as you'd expect. Um, you know, people have had a long time to think about the independence issue, but mm -hmm. but still, you know, given the closeness of, of the, the 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 margins between yes and no, if one in ten voters could be persuaded to change their mind in one direction or another, that's quite significant. And I think um, for yes the yes side it'd be particularly worrying that actually their vote looked if anything slightly softer so i think around 14 percent say of yes voters saying they could still change their mind mm -hmm. compared with about nine percent of no voters and mm -hmm. and i was going to ask emily as well um obviously one of the exciting things that, well exciting things that happened early in the election campaign was the emergence of a new party um alex salmon's um alaba party um but um, so far, um, most of the polls suggesting perhaps that they're not going to pick up um, as, as as big a share of the, the list voters they, they might have, have hoped. Um, what, what impact, if any, do you think um, the other party is, is having on the election? Yeah, well, as as you've as you said, they're they're polling at about three percent, um, which, if that translated nationally into, into, into if national vote share, if vote share translated into seats, would mean that they wouldn't win any MSPs. Um, but I think it's still something to watch very closely over the next couple of weeks because actually we know that a well-fought successful regional campaign can make a real difference to that and certainly in areas such as the northeast of Scotland for example we might see Alex Alex Salmond elected on the on, on the region on the regional vote so it is still possible that Alaba could pick up one or two MSPs so certainly something to watch 
And, and Emily, we just had a question come in um, from Richard from Altcom saying it would be interesting to see polling data on why people support or oppose independence, not not um, just whether or that they support or oppose independence. I know this is something that we asked about um, back in October in terms of the, the reasons. And I wondered if you wanted to, to say anything about that, that what what you know, what the arguments for and against independence that seemed to, to resonate with people were. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the one of the strongest strongest, or at least one of the arguments that resonates most most strongly with the public for independence is Scotland being able to to, to decide its its own future for for itself rather than um, rather than important decisions that affect its future being being taken in Westminster. And you certainly see that playing out in in the SN, in the SNP manifesto and this. Uh, and this position that you know Scotland should have its have its right right to choose and determine its its own future, but we also looked at pro union or pro pro union arguments because of course the economic arguments were so important in you know narrowly winning in winning things for for the for the for the for the better together cam campaign back in 2014, and what we found there is that those ec economic arguments are still are, are still strong and still play play well with voters. Um, but it also feels as if the, you know, if the the case for the union has not been made all that strongly in Scotland in in recent years. And there are arguments that I think Scots that just just aren't hearing that actually have the potential to 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 have an impact with people. So one argument we tested was around you know the nations of the UK having more in common than than divides them. That kind of appeal to to shared cultural cultural and historical ties. And actually that's that you know played played quite well with with voters, but it's not an argument that Scots have, have really been hearing very much. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there are any more questions coming through on the chat. Um, oh, sorry, no, I take it back. back. There's uh, polling data on the threshold in the referendum. What proportion of voters think it would be legitimate to agree independence strictly on 50% plus one? And what do voters think about establishing a turnout threshold for a referendum? Now, that is a very uh, good question. As far as I'm aware, there isn't any polling data. Well, I, I, this, certainly, I don't. We don't have any polling data on that. I'm not aware of any polling data that's asked that specifically. And obviously, that's a, you know a kind of a particularly pertinent question given that you know the the current closeness of the of the the yes versus no support um and of course in um in the uh, 1970s when uh, when there was a re referendum on um scottish devolution there was a threshold which met which was narrowly missed so in spite of the fact that quite a sizable majority of people in scotland in the 70s voted for in favor of, of, of having a devolved parliament that didn't was not passed because there had been quite a high threshold set for for passing that so it is something that that has um been brought up from time to time. I think the the, the issue now would be well, what what would be the, the sort of democratic just justification for doing that, given that we've already had a referendum that didn't have that kind of constraint, and we're also leaving the European Union, uh, well, have left the European Union rather on the basis of a referendum that did not have that kind of constraint and was very close. So, I think it would be very difficult to make a democratic argument for, for setting a threshold at, at this point although uh, i'm sure there are many on the on the no side who, who might might think that would be a a, a good idea but um, i don't know if you had any thoughts on that emily uh, i I, I agree. I agree with that. I think it's this question of precedent now, because you know, were there to be a second referendum, obviously there's there's now a precedent um, in, in 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 a way that it wasn't before. And I think you know, things like discussions around the precise question to be used and so on um, may all, may also come come back to come back to that. That there's a question that's already been been tried and tested. Yes. Yes. And I know on that again, there what there is certainly. Our body of opinion that um, that um, having that yes is a easier thing to campaign on than no, um, mm. but um, but yes again having had that question the first time around I think it, yeah there would have to be some very significant um, evidence and arguments as to why that should change in in any future referendum. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. So I, ha I have seen some polling recently that asked um, a different question around Scotland, whether Scotland should leave or leave the UK or remain. But I think given that that exact wording was used in the Brexit referendum and is so strongly associated with Brexit, there's the risk of, of con a risk of confusion there. So I would be staggered if um, if wording like that were to be were, were to be used in practice. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Every, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. It's been great to hear your questions. Um, we wish you a good good afternoon ahead, and yeah, look at look out for the election results in a couple of weeks, which I think we're likely to hear on the Saturday following the election, I believe. So.